your keys, I will have them in my pocket. So as we stand up, shake hands with one another, if you realize your keys are going, you are a frosty lover and a life air med care person. So there you go. Shake hands with one another. Tell them you're glad to see them here today. So somebody asked me, as you make your way back to your seats, uh, they are Chevrolet Keys, and like I said, you are an Air Med care person on their network, and you love Frosties, and you also have, looks like a house key on here, so. I will have them after church. Uh, you'll probably find them when you get to your car and cannot get in, so. Uh, so if you find out, I'll be at the door when you leave this morning, because it was found in this parking lot, so. <clears throat> Just ask me for them then I'll put them up so I don't forget them. All right, announcements today. We are having our church picnic today following our worship service. So if you signed up for that, we encourage you to stay and have fried chicken and sides and desserts. And then they're going to have a cornhole tournament. I think some other games here as well. So just kind of going to make an afternoon of it. So I encourage you to, to stay here for that. And 
I want to remind you that we are needing some van drivers for Sunday morning, so if you would be willing to serve in that capacity, the details are there in the bulletin. All you got to do is get in touch with me and let me know about that, and I will uh, get you and let you know the things that you have to do in, in order to be able to drive one of our vans on Sunday morning. So, also this week on tomorrow, on Monday, we'll have our weekend special Bible study from 8.30 to 10 o'clock, so that meets right here at the church, and so if you can... If you can be here for that, we encourage you to do so. And then on Tuesday is the uh, Rotary Club's blood drive, American Red Cross blood drive down at the Moose Lodge. That starts at 11 and goes to 5, so make you aware of that as well. And then I'm trying to make sure I, I'm trying to do them in order a little bit. Then next Saturday is our community church picnic at Rogier Park, and that's at 5 o'clock next Saturday evening. There is going to be a double elimination cornhole tournament there, and so that sign-up sheet is on the table in the back of the worship center. You don't have to sign up for that. Just bring your food, invite guests, come out. This is a way for us to uh, meet some people in the community and hopefully some people that are just walking through the park that we can share a picnic lunch with, kind of like five loaves and two fish. Uh, for the people that are out there on that day. So that is this coming Saturday at 5 o'clock at Rozier Park. So I'll make you aware of that as well. And then next Sunday morning following our worship service, um, we may have a special business meeting. We put it in there just in case we need it. Uh, at our last business meeting, uh, let people know that our, our giving is down. Uh, we're running behind budget, and we're running behind expenses for this year. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with higher prices, gas prices, food prices, and all of those things. So our, uh, pa our personnel committee and our finance committee is going to meet this week. I'm going to let you know. If you're on that committee, I'll send you a message uh, today to let you know what day that's going to be. And we're going to look at, I've got the financial report for June, just got that on Friday, so that we can look at maybe some decisions we need to make, uh, some adjustments to our budget possibly uh, to get through the rest of this year. So uh, just that's what that special business meeting will be about if we need it. You know, after the committees meet, we may just decide to kind of see how things go. And so, but if we need it, we want to make sure we could act on that as soon as possible. So. So that's coming up. Um, new announcement for you. This is not in your bulletin. I just got that this this morning. Uh, uh, the Vanday Association of Churches has taken over the Tools for School program. That's where they gather school supplies for people that are in need. And they're asking different churches to provide different things. And so our, our responsibility at Unity Baptist Church is to provide... Um, pocket folders so folders that have the pockets inside that they, kids can take home stuff and everything they, we need 1,000 of them now that sounds like a lot but if every we got probably 100 people in here this morning if every person in here bought 10 that's 1,000 so it's not that it's not that difficult so we want to collect those and have them back here by August the 7th so you've got basically four weeks but really the quicker you get them in here the quicker we can get them uh to the Association of Churches so they can kind of get everything together like they need it. So, uh, we, like I said, 1,000 sounds like a lot, but if just, just commit to buy 10. If you'll buy 10 and everybody in here buys 10, then we will have the 1,000 that we need. So that's, and other churches are buying other things to go in those, uh, the, the Tool for School program. So that's a new one. We'll have, I'll have more details about that in the bulletin uh, next week. And then you'll see also in the bulletin at the end of this month that uh, Brandon and Julie are having to move out of the house where they are, and they're looking for a rental. They have found a place, but it's all the way in Beecher City. Um, so in an emergency situation, that may be where they end up going, but they need to be out by the 1st of August, which is uh, the last, you know, which is not that far away, three weeks away. So they're going to have a moving party on Saturday, July the 30th. So, but if you know of a rental or know someone that has a rental here in Vandalia that would be an option for them, just contact Brandon and let him know. So, all right. Any other announcements? All right, Michelle, come lead us in our music. Good morning. Let's stand together. We're having another Old Hymn Sunday, so no excuses for not singing. Everybody should know it. When we all get to heaven. When we 
Continue singing and standing. What a day that will be. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day. This morning's sermon is entitled, A Still More Excellent Way. And it's the chapter in 1 Corinthians on love. And if you've looked at our world today, you know that the one thing that we need is one unconditional agape love in this world, where we love people. Now, that doesn't mean we don't tell them what we think think in a loving way that mean we won't that doesn't mean we won't disagree over things that means that doesn't mean we won't have conflict but everything we should do be doing in the world should be from a basis of love for other people and if that's going to happen it has to happen here first in the body of Christ 
as, as churches. We have to love one another and set an example for the world to follow. Unconditional love. And again, as we go through that passage this, today, we're, we're going to realize that we fall way short of that as Christians. We fall way short of that. We, we are not like Jesus in that way. We are constantly faulting and complaining and griping about other churches or other Christians or other people, and, and that's not what love is. Uh, and we all struggle with that. And so I, my prayer this morning is that we would learn to love the way Jesus loves us. So let's pray. Lord God, you, you told us through the Apostle Paul that there are fruits of the Spirit. There's actually nine listed in that particular uh, passage of Scripture in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, but it starts out with love. You, you begin that list with love. Because we can't do all the joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. We can't do all of the rest of those in our interactions with other people if we do not love them unconditionally first. God, that's what we need. And that only comes from... We can't, we can't do that on our own. That's why you send us the Holy Spirit. That's why at our salvation you indwell us is to guide us and direct us into loving other people because it is not natural for us to love people unconditionally. If I was to ask us to list the people that we love today, there would be conditions attached. It would be our parents and our grandparents and our kids and our siblings. and I, we, we would have con conditions attached to it. The people I work with that I like, the people that I go to church with that I like. The we'd, have, we'd have conditions based on the people that we would identify and say, I love this person. And yet, your love that comes from the Spirit, your love that we are to emulate and share with the world has no condition attached the same way you loved us in that while we were yet sinners Christ loved us and died for us on the cross that's what your word tells us and God that that change is not going to happen in this world if it doesn't start in in your body in, in the believers and the followers of Jesus Christ. It has to begin with us. And not just in this room and in this church and in the people that are members of this church, but start here and flow out into the world. But it's got to start with us. So, Lord, that's my prayer, that we would become the, the loving people that you have called us to be in this world because only then will we see the world change. In your name we pray. Amen. Michelle? <clears throat> Let's stand together. And if you pay attention to the bulletin, I'm sure you're thinking, oh, precious memories. Oh, my goodness, what a song. Can she not pick another one? That's a funeral song. No, not here. It's not going to be a funeral song. I told Pam, I said, I don't want the funeral version. I want the mm -hmm, this version, okay? So we're getting... This version. So follow us. Precious memories and because he lives. Precious memories, unseen angels, sent from somewhere to my soul. How they linger. Bye-bye. 
So for those of you that were not here last Sunday, I was preaching on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the spiritual gifts, the use of spiritual gifts that God has given us, uh, gifts, talents, abilities that we are to use in the church, use for his ministry. And, and Paul talks about how that our body is made up of different parts, but it has to have all of those different parts to work together that we, we couldn't be a body without all of those different parts, and therefore the church is the same way. 
body of believers is the same way. We can't all be, and he, he lists spiritual gifts, we can't all be apostles and, and prophets and teachers and miracle workers and healers and people who help and people who administer and tongues and interpretation of tongues and, and all the different spiritual gifts that uh, he had talked about. We can't just everybody do that one. We, we all are gifted in different ways and that we are to work together in our gifts to be the body of Christ that the world needs in order to reach them with the message of Jesus Christ. Remember, the kind of love that God has for us, the kind of love that Jesus had to, to die for us on a cross for our sins, even though we didn't deserve it, that is not natural to our world. You, you, will, you will find nowhere in our world unconditional love naturally. Some people say, well, the love of a mother for a child. Well, that's conditional. Unless you, unless you as a mother, as a woman, love all children the same way you love your own children, then there is a condition ad attached. W there is no unconditional love evident in this world naturally. It has to come from God and only through God. I had, I had a, a pastor years ago say that, you know, we truly cannot love people until we become a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. And I thought when I heard that, that, that that's wrong. I, I, I love people. You know, I was, a, I was a teenager at that time. And I said, well, I, I love people. I love this person. I love that person. And then yet as I began to examine why I love them, it all was based on some condition that was attached to my relationship with that person. The kind of love that God has and that he wants us to live and share in this world means I love the worst person I know in the same way as I love the best person I know. That's not natural. It has to come from God. And so I began to understand what that pastor was saying. And, and so Paul has listed all these spiritual gifts and he closes out 1 Corinthians 12 with a statement at the end of verse 31, and I have it up there at the beginning of our, our passages, that, and I show you a still more excellent way. So Paul has listed what the body of Christ should look like and how our gifts should be together and that we're all different and that we're all working together. And, we, and, and, and he says, gifting is wonderful. He, he's, he's, that's what he's telling us. Gifting is wonderful, but let me show you what really needs to happen. And then he gets in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse, verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love it profits me nothing so in those first three verses Paul begins listing some of those spiritual gifts some of those those things that he's just talked about and he says if I can speak in tongues but I don't love people then I'm just noise. I'm just noise. If I, if I have faith that'll remove mountains, but I, I don't have love, then, then it, it, it's, it's nothing. It, it. Because what the world needs to see from the body of Christ is unconditional love. We can, we can put on a show. We can have the clanging cymbal and the noisy gong we can have uh, a gift of prophecy and we can have uh, sermons and teachings and, and, and Bible studies that are we get into the mystery of the Bible and we dig out the knowledge of the Bible and the wisdom of the Bible and that's all great but if I'm not doing it because I love you if I'm just doing it to show off then I'm nothing if I give that self, oh, I, I sacrifice. If I give all my possessions, what Jesus tell the rich young ruler, go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. 
give, sell all my possessions, everything, I get rid of everything I have so that I can give that money to feed the poor. And I surrender my body to the flames to be burned. I, I offer my life as a sacrifice for my faith. But do not have love. It profits me nothing. If I do it for show, if I do it to create a facade, if I do it as a hypocrite, but not because I love people, then I might as well not do it. Because God's not going to honor it and he's not going to recognize it. Well, now that, that's, that's hard teaching for us. Because let's be honest. For those who, how many of you have been in church more, I'm going to, let's see, and I'm not talking about every Sunday and all of the Sunday schools and the Wednesday nights and the Sunday nights, but how many of you have been regular in church for more than 30 years? Raise your hands. Mm hmm. That's a lot of us in here. And in that 30 years or more of being regular in church, how many times were we taught to do things that look Christian to the world? Now think about that. How many times have we been really indoctrinated to act a certain way, talk a certain way, be a certain way to show that we are, and let's be honest, the reason we teach that, to show that we're better than the world out there. You say, whoa, and that's not why we, well, how many times were we taught to love people unconditionally? How many times were we, were we taught to to, to love someone unconditionally. And I have to admit, growing up in church, in church all my life, parents that went to church, I mean, we were there every Sunday. It was, it was not a Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I, like Mark Lowry says, if they were going to wash the windows, we filled our pew and watched. I mean, you were at church. We, my dad volunteered to work at church. We, my brother and I mowed the grass at the church. I mean, we were at church as much as you could be at church. But we really weren't taught love people unconditionally. We really weren't taught to, to self-sacrifice our needs and our wants and our desires for other people. A lot of times we um, did things just to, to look, look like we were loving but were we really doing it out of a place of love? And, and Paul is saying, and God is saying through Paul, that if you didn't do it from a place of love, it was worthless. He can't use anything that we do if we don't do it because we love people. If Jesus just hung on that cross and died as a show for himself to be to be a martyr to be glorified to have his body burned in the flames to be a martyr for his teachings if that's the only if that's the reason he did it we wouldn't be saved because that wouldn't be unconditional love he didn't do that for himself he did it for us and that's where the crux comes in that's where that's that's the crisis point in defining what unconditional love is is when when i am i doing this because it benefits me or I'm, am I doing this because it benefits others? And if we're honest, most of the times we show love in the world, we do it to benefit ourselves. That's just, that's just honesty. And that, that's what has to happen first. We have to be honest about where we are because we can't grow into unconditional love if we don't at first admit that I do what I do because it benefits me in some way. And that starts in the home. And that starts with husbands and wives because that happens first. It's husbands and wives first, and then it, the children come along, or that, that's the way it's supposed to. And then children come along, and then grandchildren come along, and, and then, you know, all, all those things. But it starts with a, a man and a woman who, who say they love one another with everything that they are. I include this passage of Scripture in the wedding ceremonies that I use in marriage. 
And I talk with the couples that I'm counseling as I'm getting them ready for marriage about what it means to love unconditionally. Because everybody that wants to get married, when they, when they come, Pastor, we're going to get married on this date, we, and, when, and we want you to do the ceremony. And okay, well, I require you to go through, you know, four to six counseling sessions before I'll do your, do your marriage, because I, I think counseling is much more important than this ceremony. And so we're going to, it's not hard, but just we're going to go through some times and we're going to talk about what it means to be married. It's like one of the first questions I ask is, why do you want to get married? Because I love her. Because I love him. And it's like, well, that'll change. <laughs> and if you've been married more than two years, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It, sometimes it changes after the honeymoon, but it It, it changes. It changes because men are weird and women are different. It is the truth. That's why, that's why God has to be in the center of a marriage is because we, we don't unconditionally love that person. And that's what Paul talks about in this next phase is how we do, every, we do everything out of condition and I love my wife as long as she's nice to me. As long as she's, let's, I'm going to say it, y'all plug your ears, as long as she's intimate with me. I mean, men have a definition of what they want out of their wife. Women have a definition of what they want out of the husband. Well, if he mows the grass. Boy, if he just loaded the dishwasher one time. Man, oh, when he's folding laundry, whoo. And you're laughing, but it's the truth. Comedians have known this for years. I mean, they tell jokes about it. They've been telling jokes about it since marriage began. I'm sure that somebody in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve came along and got married, somebody told a joke about husbands and wives and how men are from Mars and women are from Venus. We, even in the, the most intimate relationship that, that God compares the, the church and Jesus to, which is marriage, is still conditional. It's still conditional. Because we go to bed some nights angry at our spouse. And sometimes for the next three weeks, you know, I heard one comedian say it this time, you know, she told me that if I kept doing that, she wouldn't talk to me for, for three weeks, and she wondered why I kept doing it. <laughs> and then she didn't keep her promise, because she talked to me the rest of the day. We're, we're different, we're weird. And if we don't love one another unconditionally... A marriage won't last. We have to get to that. People, the church is the same way. We're different. We're weird. Y'all are a bunch of weirdos. Think about it. Think about it. We're a bunch of... We decided that we would believe in a God who came and lived as a man, a perfect life, and nailed himself to a cross and shed his blood so that we could have eternal life simply through faith in him. Nothing we do to earn that. And we're, now that we've believed in that, we're going to live for him and try to do our best to live a sinless life. That's weird. That's not how the world looks at religion. That's not how we as individuals before Jesus look at religion. It's all about, I do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and hopefully God will like me enough that he'll let me in the heaven. Kind of like a relationship between a husband and a wife. Well, if I do this and this and this, maybe I'll get this. If I do this and this and this, maybe I'll get that. Paul says, mm -mm, that's not love. That's not the way it works. Look at verse 4. Love, and, and I'm, I, want you to, I want you to hear this, because all of you get, all of us, I, I don't need to say you, all of us get a failing grade in the, what love is. And, and I hate to say this, but Disney, romantic songs, rom-coms, romantic comedy movies, all Hallmark has done a terrible thing with all of their movies. We, Hollywood has ruined what the concept of real love is because it all just works out in the end. But it's not hard work in the movies. Look at what love is, verse 4. Love is patient. Now think of the person that you're closest to in your relationship, whether that's husband, wife, whatever that may be. Which one of you is patient? 
Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag. Okay, I lost that one. Um, and is not arrogant. We know in my, y'all know us well enough to know I lost in that one. Uh, number verse five, does not act unbecomingly. When, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Paul, what were you, what were you specific, what thing were you specifically referring to? Because unbecomingly to me says that I don't do things, I'm not going to do something that will demean that other person. So all you practical jokers out there, hmm, careful. I mean, sometimes we do things in practical jokes and then we find out later that that really hurt that person. So love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not selfish. Is not provoked. You can't make me angry. She won't even look at me right now. taking notes oh I'm gonna hear it when I get home hey I may just I may just stay at the picnic for the rest of the week um so it does it it's not provoked it does not take into account a wrong suffered now all of us fail in that you know someone hurts me someone wrongs me someone says something mean about me someone whatever the wrong may be we 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 hang on to that another way to say that is that we, love is forgiving because people are going to mess up people are going to make mistakes and whether they did it on purpose or intentionally they messed up and it hurt and love forgives it doesn't put into an account it does not, re it does not rejoice in unrighteousness ha <laughs> ha they got what they deserved no mm mm that's not love but rejoices with the truth love bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things now think about that now think about that your closest relationship and how many of those did you get right we are least patient with people that we're closest to well he should know better well she should realize we're least we are least kind to people that we're closest to oh we'll be kind to strangers out there in the walmart parking lot oh i'm just can i help you and, da, da, da. and we get home oh well i'm not going to help put up the laundry she did the laundry she's got to put it up think about it we are least kind to the people we're closest to we we act unbecomingly around the house well i'm just picking on you we well, if he'll do this, if she'll do that, then I'll help with that. We seek our own. This is what I want. And we, we, we keep a record of wrongs suffered. I, I don't think, I, I've never met a couple. I've counseled a lot of couples uh, through the years in marriage, um, struggling in marriages, and I've never found anyone with a notebook of wrongs suffered keeping a record of all the things that not a physical one but they've got it right up here because I've counseled couples and, and be talking to them and, and he or she will either one will say something about something that that spouse did that hurt them terribly and it's like well, when did that happen well that's 10 years ago okay people Real love lets it go. Should they ask forgiveness? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes, sometimes people say things, do things that hurt us, and they, don't, they didn't intend it that way, they didn't mean it that way, or they didn't realize that it was hurtful. And, and so when they, when they find out, if you're like me, when I, when I find out, I go apologize. I, I, it's not what I meant. I'm sorry. You know, I had, in Tennessee, I had a, um, a couple that, in our church that was going through a tough time in their family, and I was talking to the wife, and I said something uh, in her presence that was, it was a truth, but I didn't mean it in a negative way. 
And I don't think she took it in a negative way, but she repeated it to her husband when she got home, and I got word back that, that he was never coming back to church as long as I was pastor there. And when I asked his wife, what? And she says, well, I told him what you said. I go, but you understand, I didn't mean that. She says, I, I understand. So what did I do? Went to his house and apologized. Went to his house and apologized. I said, I need you to forgive me. He, he did. Thankfully, he did. But it was just like, sometimes we mess up and we don't even know we messed up. But how many of us have that little book in our head? Well, remember when she did this? Remember when he did that? Remember when they did that? How many of us have that book about people that we go to church with? Oh, I remember when. We have churches that people won't talk to each other. I don't know why they don't leave and go to another church, but we have churches out there where one, one family group, one, one clique sits on this side and another clique sits on this side, and they don't speak on Sunday morning because they're mad at one another for something that happened with their grandfathers 40 years ago, and they've never let it go. That's not love, people. Love's patient. Love doesn't fail. Love do doesn't seek its own. Love is not arrogant or braggadocious. Uh, love is caring. Love is forgiving. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Why? Because, because we love people. We are called as Christians to love people. Not just to act like it, but to truly love people. Because if we don't, we can't impact this world. Why are we in the culture and the situation we are? As a, we are a nation divided. We are a nation that's filled with hate. We are a nation that despise, people despise others that are not like them. Why are we there? How did we get there? Well, let's be honest. We as the church haven't loved the lost in the last 60 years the way we should. So we haven't been modeling love and they can't model love because they don't understand unconditional love. If they're not a follower of Jesus, they don't get it. They, it it's all about how, how does this help me? How does this please me? How does this fit with my agenda? They are all the things that Paul just said that we're not supposed to be. And then Paul goes on in verse 8, love never fails. And so he's talking to the Corinthian church here where they've been, they've been dealing with this spiritual gift thing and like, well, I've got the gift of this and I've got the gift of that. And you can tell by this chapter that one of the things that was happening in the church was my gift's better than yours. God has given me the gift of whatever. Apostleship, teaching, wisdom, speaking in tongues, healing, uh, miracles, what, whatever, they, whatever it is. But you can tell by what Paul is saying here that they're bragging about it. Well, God made me this in the church. And that's better than what you do in the church. And so what does he say? Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Paul says love endures, but everything else is going to pass away. Verse 9 says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes... Now, I want to make this clear because I've heard denominations and other pastors and things come up with different ways. When the perfect comes, that's Jesus, okay? Don't try to think that that's anything. When the perfect comes, the only thing that's perfect is Jesus, is God, and he's coming back. And at some point, he will return, and he will gather us all together. And Paul says, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. In other words, the gifts that they were using in the church was to lead people to Jesus. But there's going to come a point when he returns that we don't need prophecy. We don't need gifts of healing. We don't need miracles to be done. We don't need people speaking in tongues or interpreting tongues. We don't need gifts of administration or hospitality or benevolence because when Jesus comes back... He's going to make it all right. So when, perfect, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. 
And then he compares it to a couple things. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Now, boy, I could, if I could take that verse and apply it to the men of the world today, I think I would accomplish a lot of things. Hey, you're an adult now. Act like it. Put away the childish things. But Paul's saying here, you know, there's things we do and we think, you know, we believe in dragons and unicorns. We believe that one day I'll be able to fly. We believe that, that you know, certain things are real when we're kids. But when we become adults, we know better. Paul's saying, you know, we're, we're squabbling like, he was telling the church, you're squabbling like children in this church about who's best, who's best, who does, God loves me best. You know how kids are. Dad loves me more than you. I'm mom's favorite. I was the middle child, so I didn't fit into either one of those categories. The favorite was my sister, because she was the youngest, and she was the baby, and she was the girl, and she was the, you know, so she was, she was, she was the favorite, and, and then my, my dad got along with my brother so much better, because my dad and I were a lot alike, so you know how that goes. So, you know, we, we pick and choose, don't we? But when you grow up, you get over those things. You start, you need to act like it. If we, if I could, boy, if, if I was going to do a men's conference, it would be that verse right there. Men, grow up. Grow up. You don't need, you don't need bigger and more expensive toys. Grow up and be an adult. Sorry, that's a sermon within a sermon. Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. When Jesus returns, all these, all these things we've been trying to, to learn and understand and do in the world, we're going to finally go, oh, that's what he meant by that. The best theologian, the best scholar, the best pastor, the best student of Scripture out there, stumbles around in the dark trying to interpret parts of the Bible. Some things are pretty straightforward. This chapter is pretty straightforward. But some things are difficult. And, and I know we're, one of these days when Jesus comes back we're, and he's going to go, I meant this. Oh, now I get it. Because we, we see through, we see right now through the fog of our flesh, which is imperfect, which is corrupted, which is sinful. And that's, and that's why we have Christian... I'm going to say this, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean or anything. You know, and anytime you say that and you're saying you're not trying to be mean, you're probably about to say something mean. Because um, I don't mean this mean. But that's why we have Christians in the world today who struggle with, is abortion wrong? Is homosexuality wrong? Is pedophilia wrong? Is, there, there's, they make a list of things that are out there. Is, is that wrong? And, and, they, and they struggle. They struggle with that because they're looking at the Bible and Jesus through the fog of their sinful flesh, just like all of us. Just like all of us. We, it's hard to set aside the corruptness of our flesh and deal with the purity of Christ's spirit that's in us because that's counter, that's counter to our nature. I'm supposed to love someone who harms my child unconditionally and as much as I love my child? Yes, that's what God says. I can't do that. No, you can't. God has to do it through you. But eventually when Jesus comes back, all of that's going to disappear and we're going to see clearly, we're going to know clearly, we're going to love unconditionally. Somebody, somebody asked me, Pastor, will, will I be married to my wife in heaven? Will, we, will, will I know that she was my wife? That, happened, that question comes up a lot at funerals when a spouse has passed away. Oh, well, you know, I, I, they, they won't be my spouse in heaven. In it. And again, looking through a glass dimly, looking through the fog of my flesh and trying to understand what God says, I, I, you'll know you were married to them, yes. You'll know they were your spouse. But guess what? 
You're not going to you're going to love them so much more than you love them here and you're going to love the per, the Christian that you liked the least in your church more than you ever loved your spouse here. We're going to be that different because of the agape love of God that will truly be able to exist in us when we get to heaven. It, you, it it's going to be amazing. Think, th- just think right now. Who's the person I love the most and who's the person I love the least? And you're going to love them both greater than you do here when we finally get to heaven and in the presence of Jesus. That's how powerful love is. That's why it has to be, that's why Paul is saying it has to be the motivating characteristic and the overwhelming characteristic of the church, the body of Christ in the world. Because Only that way will we welcome in everyone out there who needs Jesus instead of putting conditions on it. Well, we want them to come here, but they got to act this way. We want them to come here, but they got to believe this. We want them to come here, but they got to go through this class or that class. And we, we condition everything, and that's why the church does not reach the lost. And if we reach them and they come in and they sit for a little while, a lot of times they disappear and go back out. Because we don't have here what they've found out there in the world, which a lot of times is more unconditional, seems like, than what we have here. Because what happens when a lost person gets saved? You got to do this, 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 and this. You got to act this way. No, you don't. You don't got to do nothing. You got to believe in Jesus and let Jesus work through you, and he will start to change you into the person that he wants you to be. Just like he's changing all of us. Why? Because he loves us. And he wants us to love others. Verse 13, he closes with this. But now faith, hope, and love, faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Why is love the greatest? Had that question a long time ago. Why is love the greatest? It's pretty simple. When I get to heaven... Do I need faith? Nope. What's my faith in? What if I put my faith in? I put my faith in Jesus Christ. When I get to heaven, he's going to be there. (laughs) Right now, I believe Jesus lived as a human being, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, and rose from a grave. And he did that to provide a way, a door, an opportunity, a gate so that we can get to heaven if we put our faith in him. And I believe that with everything I am. And my faith is in him and him alone. But it's faith. I don't know it. It could all be made up. It could all just be story. I don't believe that for one minute, so don't hear that. But I don't know it because I hadn't seen him yet. When I get to heaven, I don't need faith anymore. Faith's gone because he's standing right there. I see him face to face. Hope. Boy, I hope Jesus comes back soon. Boy, I do hope that. I hope Jesus comes back soon. I, I, when I look at the world that we're in, I, I hope, well, I hope Jesus comes back soon for me. But I hope he tarries for those that don't know him. Because once he comes back, it's over. But when I get to heaven, what's my hope going to be in? My hope's in Jesus, and he's there. But when I get to heaven, when will I stop loving Jesus? And when will he stop loving me? Never. The greatest of these is love because it's the only one that lasts for eternity. Because it's the only one that we'll need. And I can't wait to start loving others the way Jesus loves me. And I need to be working. I I, I understand I'm not going to get it here. I understand that people are going to make me angry or I'm going to choose to get angry at the things that they do. I know that I'm going to get frustrated and I'm going to get depressed and I'm going to get down and I'm going to struggle doing the right thing at times because this flesh is, is powerful. And we're just selfish. 
And it's easier to do what our flesh says than to do what the Spirit says. So I, I, I get it. We're not going to make it to full and complete unconditional love here, more than likely. But we need to try. We need to try. Instead of just saying, well, I can't love that person. The person that you think you can't love, start praying for them. Because you can't hate someone you're praying for. Think about that. The person that you're most frustrated with, start praying for them. Because it's hard to pray for someone that you're frustrated with. Because what God, when you start praying, you're talking to God about this person. And your prayer may start out, God, you know, if you'd remove that person from the face of the earth, I'd be okay with that. That may be how you start. That may be your first prayer. But as you start praying for that person and God's Spirit starts speaking to you, that's going to change and your hatred will begin to melt away because you're, you're giving God the, the permission to change who you are and how you feel. You're letting love abide and letting it take over so that you can be the believer that God wants us to be. And if we, all of us as a church, will start doing that, we'll become the body that God intended us to be to change this world. Let's pray. Father, help us get out of the way. Yes, my flesh, I see through a glass dimly. I, I, but Lord, we, we, we say when, perf, when the perfect comes... Well, Lord, you've already come. You indwell us. You're already here. You're, you already have influence on my life if I will let you. So, Lord, help us to quit waiting for when you come and then I'll love everybody like I'm supposed to and let you begin loving the people around me through me right now. God, when we start praying for that to happen, we may have to go and apologize to some people. We may have to go and ask forgiveness. We may have to go and mend some fences because we've done things out of anger, frustration, hatred even, that we're not very loving. But God, if we go and repair that relationship and begin to love that person the way you love them, the way you love me, how will that change this world? Jesus, help us give in to love and let it flow from us. In your name we pray, amen. Michelle, it's going to come as you stand. We'll sing. Time of invitation. The altar is open if you need to come. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy Charlie to come up here. This is Charlie Fraley. Am I right? And Charlie and I talked a couple of weeks ago. She'd been talking to her mom and dad about, uh, I, want to, I'm, I want to believe in Jesus. I want to get baptized. And all that. So we, we talked a couple of weeks ago, and I asked her all the questions. I want to make sure they understand. And, uh, and she, boy, she, she, she said, I'm ready. I know what it means to follow Jesus. I know what it means to give my life to him, and I want to do what he wants to do. And I said, well, you understand baptism doesn't save you. And we went up and looked at the baptistry and, and talked about that. And she says, I know, I know. I, and I said, do you want to pray and ask Jesus into your heart? She says, I've already done that. See, she's, I mean, that's the way I, I like to see it as a pastor. With that We've taught them, and they know how to do that without us having to do that for them. So she comes forward to let you know that today and so that we can set up her baptism. So congratulate her on that decision.
I'm going to ask Doug and Tina to come up here, and Ryan can come too if she wants to, and stand with her. And then as we close, they'll come. Everybody will come around and they'll hug you and congratulate you and, and all of those things. And so, so we're going to do that. And remember, come around this way. And then we've got the picnic afterwards for those of you that signed up to participate in that today. So I'm going to say a blessing real quick for the food and I'm being told from the back of the room I'm being given direction that go out that hallway and go down and go in to get your into the kitchen to get your food so so that's the way you're going to go when you go into the um, to get your food for the picnic and then there'll be a cornhole tournament and those other things don't forget if you get to your car and can't get in, I have your keys. So yeah, they were out in the parking lot. So if you lost your keys, I have them. I'll be at this door. So let me bless the food, and then Michelle's going to lead us in our closing chorus. Father, thank you. Thank you for Charlie, Charlie's salvation. Lord, we know that she was ready, and she gave her life to you, and now we're going to... She, she's showing that publicly by coming forward this morning, and we're going to e emphasize that even more publicly through her baptism, which we'll set up here in the next few weeks. And so, Lord, thank you for what the decision that she's made. And Lord, help us as her church, as her family, as the body of believers around her, help her grow in her faith. More importantly, help her grow in love and learn to, to love others the way Jesus, you loved us. And that's, that's what we should be doing as her family, as her church family. So Lord, thank you for her decision. Lord, thank you for this time of fellowship that is coming and the, the food that's been prepared. Lord, a very special blessing on all of those hands. And just, Lord, let us have a great time just loving one another as your body this afternoon as we fellowship together. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, Michelle, lead us in our closing song. Family of God. I'm so glad. Fountain. 